Okay. And then finally, I want to talk about kind of our active brains, right? And what can we do, um, you know, when we're, when people say that they're, you know, they're having their bad sleep and they're kind of wired, but tired, right? This feeling that there's just lots of stuff going on in our brains. And some of this is, you know, uh, reasonable, but it's oftentimes in the middle of the night, we're just like not in our best place to kind of solve problems. But, you know, it's, that's what happens, right? We wake up in the middle of the night and we kind of try to tackle these big issues, but we're not, we're not in the right place to do so. And so what can we do to try to protect that evening or that, that bedtime and that throughout the night and push that into the daytime? So, um, here, I want to talk about a, a couple of different strategies. So what can we do to manage our active brain during the day? Um, you know, one thing that I think is, is really important um, and is really just about self-care, but also preventing some of these stressors to kind of build up where they do become a problem at night is to schedule breaks, right? We can think of them as micro breaks. You can kind of put these into your schedule for say 10 minutes a day and you can use it as your time. I think one of the things that's emerged, you know, during the, the pandemic is this thing called revenge bedtime procrastination, right? So this, this tendency for people to kind of have very little autonomy over their day. And so at night they put off going to bed because it's the only time they can do things for themselves. And so I'm suggesting that maybe one other strategy would be to actually try to build in some of this time in your schedule. And of course, like, look, of course, it's really easy for me to say, do, oh yeah, take some scheduled breaks, but maybe they can be really small. Maybe we can start small and just say, you know, take an extra lap around, um, around your, your, where you live or around the block, um, just to give yourself some headspace to, you know, do a meditation, just take some deep breaths or just give yourself some feeling of peace. Um, which can, we know can be helpful uh, and, and will help manage your stress as it, as it potentially builds throughout the day. The other thing is, you know, really scheduling time to worry so that you're not actually bringing that into bed with you. Um, this is called worry scheduling. We suggest, you know, say take 15 minutes, schedule it into your calendar where you sit down and you just worry and you use that whole 15 minutes. You can't say, oh, I got nothing to worry about today. It's like, no, it's like, it's like exercise. It's like you just do it. and that way you, you kind of spend this time worrying on whatever you want. And then at night, if it comes up, you can say, okay, look, I, I actually scheduled this in my, in my planner. I worried about it today and I have it scheduled for tomorrow. And over time, that can decrease the time in which your brain will kind of start populating um, the, the night with those same kind of worries. Um, getting into the habit of trying to tackle these things and being, you know, proactive around it can be, you know, really beneficial for people. Related to that is another strategy called constructive worry. And so this is more of a problem solving one. But again, it's something that you, you focus on so that it doesn't crop up at night. And so in this instance, you actually identify a couple problems that you're struggling with um, and you kind of write them out. So writing is really important um, to actually get them down on paper and kind of, you know, translate your thinking into words. Um, and then you want to you know, write the problem, say maybe the three problems, and then try to identify the first two steps in tackling that problem, right? You don't have to solve the whole thing. Some problems aren't even solvable, but you want to kind of think about the next couple steps, right? And you want to try to pick problems that you think might pop up in the middle of the night. And so what you do is you write this out, you fold the piece of paper up and you say, okay, I've done this. I've identified the next steps. I know what I need to do. And then you take it and you put it by your bedside. And there's something about the ritual of this, that you've done this. And then it's by your bedside. And if you wake up in the middle of the night, you can look over at it and say, look, I, I did it. I know what I need to do next. And it can kind of take that off your plate. And again, over time can be really helpful for some people in managing some of that worry at night. And then, of course, there's kind of traditional stress management things, right? Like there's lots of um, tools out there. Um, you know, we off always recommend kind of relaxation strategies like on, on apps that are available, often many of them freely, just to kind of, you know, help you manage your stress level so that it doesn't kind of crop into the night. Okay, so those are things you can do during the day. And then look, like you can do all these things, best laid plans. In the night, maybe it doesn't work as well. Um, and so what do we, what can we do during the night? So um, 
first of all, as I mentioned, again, around this condition arousal, you want to do it out of bed, right? You don't want to spend a lot of time in bed doing all these kind of activities and trying to manage your, your brain. If, and, and, I, and I gave kind of the, the recommendation of like 20 minutes. If you wake up and your brain is just super active and you know you're not going to fall back to sleep, you don't need to wait 20 minutes. You want to get out of bed, kind of do these things to calm yourself back down. Um, and that, that can be helpful. Um, things that are known to be effective are things like meditation or progressive muscle relaxation. Um, all of those things for some people are helpful in kind of increasing that parasympathetic nervous system, that rest and digest system that allow you to kind of get back to sleep. Distraction is, is really helpful. So, you know, you can only hold so many things in your mind at once. And so kind of populating it with other things can be really helpful. And, and, and so this may be reading, it may be uh, watching television, things that can take your mind off of the, the active issues. And, and think of it as, you know, you're investing in these strategies, even though they may not um, produce immediately uh, falling back to sleep as a way of, um, you know, trying to, to kind of ensure that you will get sleepy in the near, near term. Um, guided imagery and gratitude journals can be helpful. Um, and so, you know, rather than, again, getting back to the kind of the distraction, um, focusing on kind of a, a pleasant moment, you know, getting again to that, that uh, high, low arousal, pleasant affect, um, kind of walking through kind of, you know, all the details of that image, whether it's a beach, a forest, whatever, um, seems to be really uh, special to you. And focusing on, on that can kind of fill up your mind, but also provide some um, positive feelings. Uh, and, and help facilitate sleep. And then the final thing, oh, paradoxical intention. This is kind of another similar one where people actually try to stay awake instead of focusing in on sleep. So taking the power out of the fact that you're not sleeping and instead focusing on staying awake can has been shown to actually help people fall asleep, um, kind of taking all the power out of the concern around insomnia. And then finally, um, kind of, you know, we can't control all of our thoughts. And so another opportunity is doing something, you know, around acceptance, but something called thought spotting. And so this is, this is, you know, certainly in line with kind of mindfulness-based practices where, you know, you let thoughts come and go, um, just noting the detail of them. And, and I, it's called thought spotting because there, there was, uh, you know, years ago, a hobby, um, which I just find to be so, seems so wholesome to me uh, around, uh, trains. And so people on the platform would watch trains go by and note down all the descriptors for them in, in kind of a journal. And I think the same thing applies to thoughts, right? So it's, you know, noting thoughts and what they like and letting them go is very different than being on the train or being in the thought, right? You have no control over where it goes. It's usually not going to a great destination. And um, it's much uh, more effective in kind of you know, bringing on sleepiness, if you actually just note the thought and let it pass by, knowing that another one is on its way uh, versus kind of taking a ride there. So, you know, all of these things uh, can be used in combination. And I like to think of it as more of a recipe than a menu, right? So they they happen, you do them all, and, um, you know, they, uh, they accumulate over time, you know, and, and it's more like a recipe. And then it takes, it needs time to bake, right? So it takes time for you to see the benefits, but, you know, certainly a better strategy than reaching for medication. But so what if it's more serious and, and these things don't seem uh, to be kind of in line with what you want to be doing? Uh, some people have insomnia disorder. So this is difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, or waking up too early. They have daytime dysfunction and it's chronic. So it's happening many times a week for three months. Um, I want to urge everyone that they, they talk to their uh, physician and, and ask about cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which is known to be the first line treatment. The things I described today are certainly principles from cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. That's what we do in our clinic, but it's not the same as working with a, with a clinician um, to, who can personalize it and use your information to, to get you kind of what, what you might need if things are particularly severe or there's kind of unique circumstances um, to your life. And I, I really urge people to try this before starting sleep medication. Sleep medication is typically fine in an acute setting, but you know, even if they're not physiologically uh, addictive, uh, people become psychologically dependent on sleep medications almost immediately. And that's a hard thing to get off. And I think there are ways to do it without that. So um, you know, I, I threw a lot at you. In summary, sleep is fundamental to health. And while we may, it may feel broken for many of us, 
it isn't. It's in there. There's no instances where I'm like, oh, your your whole sleep system is broken. Um, these behavioral techniques can be really effective and and giving you more of that sleep back. Um, predictability is key, uh, as I mentioned throughout this uh, presentation. Um, maintain a stable wake time. Uh, protect your wind down. Stay out of bed when you cannot sleep. Um, manage your stress the best you can. And I, I provided some strategies for that. And then really enhance your sleep balloon. And you do these things. And my hope is that uh, for many, many folks, uh, this will get, help get their sleep back on track. Um, and so if anybody has any questions, I, I love to, to talk sleep and I really appreciate your attention. All right. And so I think Nicole said that I will uh, field the questions. Um, and so the, the question that I have written in the chat um, is about um, shift work and irregular work schedules. And what, what should people do if they are working extensively at unpredictable times or irregular times of the day? And this is, you know, this is a really hard challenge. Anybody who's done shift work uh, knows the challenges of trying to sleep during the day. Um, you know, I can say that, uh, you know, trying to protect that sleep time is critical, right? So, you know, you know, making sure that your sleep environment is uh, conducive to sleep, especially because the daylight, it's daylight out, um, you know, making sure that it's dark, you protect yourself from sunlight as best you can and ensure that you have the time to sleep. Scheduled naps before shifts can also be really helpful just to help people get the sleep they need. I, I mentioned not taking naps, but, you know, this is an instance where it might be. Uh, and then, you know, it, it's 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 just kind of trying to manage the best we can um, because of this kind of misalignment of your circadian rhythm and uh, the day, like the, the world and, and the time in which you need to sleep is just, it's a really challenging one. Um, and so, you know, it may be, there are medications that are coming on the market that may be particularly effective for this. Um, and so, you know, that might be something that, that you wanna look into as well. Um, but, you know, I, I'd certainly hear you. It is, it's a big challenge. Um, let's see. So Nicole, if you can hear me, there were no other ones written in the chat, but they're also, uh, oh, I am, um, I am writing them into the chat, just like transferring the ones in the Q and A oh. into the chat. So if you, you should probably have gotten another one. I just sent another one. Okay, great. Um, is there an optimal time of day you should exercise to sleep better? Um, so this is a really great question. Um, and, and we know that exercise is so critical uh, for our health. Um, but there is always the concern of, you know, whether you should sleep uh, too, or you should exercise too close to bedtime. It is kind of bimodal in that way that um, for some people, it can be exhausting for them, and they can sleep just fine. For others, it can be really activating. And, you know, you just need to kind of uh, see what works best for you. Uh, you know, there was a recent study that kind of just came out around, you know, exercise when people don't get enough sleep. And, you know, is, is it, is there a time of day when people can exercise despite having sleep loss? And in that evidence uh, suggested that, um, you know, actually doing your exercise in the morning, even after a night of kind of really bad sleep, uh, seems to be the most effective in part because you can take advantage of that circadian um, burst that you get in the morning. So even when people have, even when we deprive people of a whole night of sleep, they tend to get this burst of energy in the morning around the time that they typically get up because their circadian system is coming back online. And so, um, and so that is, uh, you know, that's, that's another uh, part of it, but um, you know, it, it exercise and when you can, can sleep better, it's really, you know, a, a good kind of N of one experiment that people can do for themselves to see, uh, you know, whether there's someone that, you know, gets affected when it's too close to bedtime or, um, you know, earlier in the day is better for them. Okay. So uh, does seven hours of sleep per night include waking moments? Um, and so, so that, that question is, is related to like, you know, I say when the recommendation is at least seven hours per night, that's actually of sleep, not of time in bed. Right. So most of us, it takes like at least 15 minutes, you know, in, unless we're kind of sleep deprived, maybe it takes you know zero minutes to fall asleep. Um, and then we might wake up during the night. We, we're really talking about kind of total amount of sleep. That's hard to judge. And I, 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 I really try to be thoughtful about kind of not being kind of so strict on that. I mean, a lot of it has to do with how you're feeling during the day. 
right? Um, sometimes people get seven hours of sleep and and they feel um, they they still don't feel good, and and maybe they need more, or there's something else going on with their sleep. I mean, undiagnosed obstructive sleep apnea is 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 one of those things that can really muck around with people's ability to sleep uh, or have that feeling of of enough sleep. Um, but also, there's a continuum of how much uh, people's sleep need is, right? So there are there are people that need less, but there are also people who need more. Um, and but it is about the total amount of sleep that they can get. Um, and then, let's see. Is dependence on sleep medication harmful if even if successfully helps you sleep? Uh, that's a great question. So sleep medications um, are, you know, people have a dependence on them, and that's that's a big challenge. And, and our goal is to always get them off of them. One of the concerns is related to kind of chronic use and what it does for our health, right? Um, and it is, you know, it does help produce better sleep for a lot of people. Um, though it isn't necessarily kind of natural sleep, um, which and and we're you know we're still learning about that, but we're also trying to learn about what chronic use of these medications does to the brain. And so while there isn't kind of clear causal evidence yet, there is you know some growing evidence that for some of these things, like benzodiazepines, for example, uh, seems to potentially put people, chronic use of those might put people at increased risk for uh, early uh, mild cognitive decline. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, and, and its impact on the brain. And so, and, but, and, and then along with that, there's also risks that come along with these medications, particularly as we get older, people, we're concerned about fall risks and, um, and those sorts of things. And so, you know, ideally we can try to get people off of them. Now, if people use them kind of here and there, like maybe it's, it's, you know, it's about a kind of acute risk and um, we're still learning about that. But in general, um, you know, we, the chronic use of these medications, particularly some of these more uh, powerful prescription medications seems to uh, potentially be problematic in the long term. And then the follow-up question was, what about natural sleep aids like melatonin or herbal remedies? Melatonin is an interesting one. Uh, certainly kind of regularly used in the U.S. Uh, over the counter, I know um, uh, by prescription um, elsewhere. A and, you know, the, the efficacy data on treating insomnia, it's not very strong, right? So it doesn't seem to be, you know, at least compared to placebos to be, you know, incredibly effective. It, but, but, you know, that being said, like lots of people tell me that it is. And so I think it does potentially do something. Um, chronic use of it, again, we, we're unsure, but there doesn't seem to be, one of the concerns is that you know, people will chronically take melatonin and they'll kind of burn out their pineal gland and they won't make it themselves. And um, there doesn't seem to be like a lot of strong evidence for that per se, but, you know, it does speak to kind of the dependence issue. And I always say that, you know, a lot of these things, maybe they aren't harmful for you, but then I wonder like what happens if you don't have it, right? Like if you go somewhere and you forgot your melatonin at home, what's going to happen? And if you're going to have a, you know, terrible insomnia, as a consequence, you might want to start thinking about, you know, are are there other strategies um, that can help me sleep naturally, like the like the ones that I mentioned, which do take time, right? They do take effort. They they are trying to fix the problem versus masking the problem, um, but you know, might be in the long term a better way to ensure the sleep you, you get the sleep you need than the dependence on on whatever uh, pill that seems to be available. Um, let's see. And then the last question, is there such a thing as too much sleep? This is a, this is another great question. And it's something I don't, I didn't touch on. And so I talked about kind of the consequences of insufficient sleep. In a lot of cases there, if you look at the literature, you see a similar relationship uh, for negative health outcomes when people get like excessively long amounts of sleep. So, you know, we're talking like 11, 12 hours. And again, there's a continuum. Some people need that much. But you know, a lot of times there's it's people are getting it and it's not clear um, why, but it seems to be associated with like a number of negative health outcomes, including cardiovascular disease, mortality, all the all the things I mentioned earlier. And you know, it's it's a little bit of a conundrum. And and so you know, some people think, uh, and we're still trying to get to the bottom of it, that you know maybe it's a symptom right? That, you know, when we have an infection, for instance, we often end up, our sleep has changed and we often sleeping, sleep more as a way of recovery. But if someone has kind of a prodromal kind of undiagnosed problem, 
you know, maybe it shows up in sleep. And so that's why long sleep is associated with these negative health outcomes. There was something there that was kind of unmeasured. Um, other instances are, you know, maybe it's something to do with depression. We know that depression is associated with a lot of these negative health outcomes and subtypes of depression around hypersomnia um, might, that might be at play there. So we're still trying to figure out, it does seem like at the population level that long sleep is associated with um, these negative health outcomes. Um, but it also it, you know, at, at the individual level, it may be that you need more or, you know, you want to look at like, is it, are you chronically getting, needing more all the time? And you might want to get checked out by your physician to see if, you know, there's any, any, any issues in, in kind of like the biochemistry uh, domain, but, you know, trying to think about how you, you know, we can better regulate your sleep so that you feel more restored during the day um, is, is always the, the, the right next step. Thank you so much, Eric, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and hopefully, we will all find a better night's sleep starting starting from tonight. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for having me.